Good morning. My name is Jonathan Zittrin, and I'm pleased to moderate today's session on the Big Brother problem. Uh, in addition to those in the room, uh, in the spirit of transparency and big siblingness, I should let you know that this is being webcast live to the world at large, and there are also opportunities to uh, tweet back with the hashtag of WEF Cyber, as in World Economic Forum Cyber, and we have an incredibly uh, fun, if Byzantine, system by which those tweets can be sorted, massaged, sort of a big data exercise put through the uh, iPad here and possibly introduced into the discussion. We have exactly 60 minutes, which is not a lot of time, and a fantastic panel with which to cover that time. So uh, I want to jump right in. Um, it may be optimistic to call this the Big Brother problem because it presumes there's only one. Um, I'd like to narrow that down a little bit, and I think perhaps turning to Salil Shetty is the right way to start with that. Uh, Amnesty International has been a sort of beacon to the world since 1961. Uh, wherever there is a question of human rights, Amnesty has been there, Nobel Prize winning uh, organization. So Salil, give us uh, your best shot at describing what's worrying you in this zone. Thank you, Jonathan. I think uh, you know, if, if you think of the defining issues of our times in relation to human rights, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we were talking about civil rights and we talked about women's rights. Uh, this question of uh, the right to privacy must be one of the defining issues of our times. Uh, and, and essentially, you know, fundamentally, I think governments uh, behave the same way over time. Uh, I remember that you know, in my house in India, our letters used to be opened by the government. Uh, our phone line, my father's a journalist, and I was shocked one day in the morning to find our telephone number, our landline, on top of a list of numbers that the government was tapping because my father was uh, raising issues about the government's performance. So, uh, so it's not very different. I mean, Amnesty International's website is blocked by Saudi Arabia and China, for example. So these are all kind of different manifestations of government paranoia. So I think essentially we're in the same space. And, and the idea of saying that if you have nothing to hide, you don't need to worry. Uh, it, I think, a very dangerous route to go down. So kind of these open-ended fishing expeditions by governments to go and see whatever they can do. I mean, it's not for no, it's not with reason that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and many of the world's constitutions have enshrined the right to privacy. It is an essential human right, and irrespective of which geography, which location, yes. every citizen has an equal right to privacy. And speaking early in 2014, what would characterized as the one or two most significant and new threats to that privacy right? Well, fundamentally, it's the whole issue of, you know, this, this false uh, positioning of this debate that you have to choose between security and protection versus liberty and freedom. And that's the fundamental problem. And of course, governments have to protect citizens. But you cannot have mass surveillance without a legal basis and without any judicial review. This uh -huh. is just simply a violation of international law. Got it. Senator Leahy, maybe I should turn to you. You are now, uh, and have been now for a while, the most senior member of the Senate, the president pro, uh, pro tempore. You came into the United States Senate on the heels of Watergate. Uh, certainly a lot of privacy worries there. And you've been chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So a lot of the American legislation uh, dealing with things has, has come through your top, as it were. And I'd like to let you weigh in and tell us uh, first, how afraid you are about Big Brother, and secondly, presuming there are some people out here afraid, and uh, I gave Salil a couple opportunities to do it, and he didn't take it. So pre pretend that he had said, Snowden, NSA. <laughs> what would you say to assure people concerned about that sort of stuff uh, that they shouldn't be uh, as worried? Well, I tell people, no matter where they're from, they should always worry about their privacy being compromised. Salil made it very clear when he said that uh, every, every country, there's differing levels of that. It's the father's phone being tapped, China and Russia blocking Amnesty International, one of the great organizations. Uh, I came in at the time, Watergate, as you said, the very first vote I ever cast in the Senate was for the church committee to... Uh, investigate the excesses of the FBI and others, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, 
who was wiretapping people who were protesting the Vietnam War or uh, taking positions he, he didn't agree with. Now, if fly forward to today, if you had somebody like J. Edgar Hoover in the government with the unbelievably different ability to wiretap everything else, then you've got to, you've got to be frightened. I, I go on the assumption that privacy is an important human right. And we don't make ourselves safer by wiretapping or investigating every single person. One thing, if you, if you collect everything, you really don't have anything. Uh, you, have, you have the haystack. You don't have the needle in it. And uh, I wrote in the first Patriot Act, I wrote with uh, Dick Army, who's a very conservative House Republican leader, much different philosophically than I. We wrote in sunset provisions, so it forced people to look at it. We have another one of those sunset provisions coming up next year. It is forcing everybody to, uh, to look at it. I'm hoping it will make some major changes in how we collect information because we're in the United States, which is, should be one of the freest countries to express yourselves, we're collecting far too much information. It is not making us safer. Now, I know that uh, legislation can be long and complicated, but what are the uh, principal changes you would like to see happen in the American framework, at least, uh, on surveillance? Well, one, one thing that's actually getting... Um, I'm getting a lot of support from people who are far more conservative than I, I am and from the other party is in getting rid of the collection of megadata, uh, collecting everything, all your phone calls. And metadata is data about data. So yeah, like, well, I, I say, what, I, but what I, the, I, I meant right. it more as a pun calling megadata, but it oh, is Oh, I metadata. see. You said megadata. Yeah, but it is Glad metadata. It is metadata, of course. And <laughs> Megadata. I, but every phone call you've made is in there somewhere. Every phone call I've made is in there somewhere. Why? What do we gain by this? And um, it, it creates an area of suspicion. Now, I would say, uh, as critical as I've been of some of the things we've done here, and as critical as I've been of the NSA, I think of some of the countries that have been critical of the United States. I think of the old movie Casablanca. I'm shocked to find gambling going on here especially when we know the amount of wiretapping and, and surveillance these other countries are suddenly very critical. And it's pristine. almost like being shocked that there's dinner going on. In the shocked there's dinner going on. Yeah. Well, they were all at Davos. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, what yes. I want to try to do is, is cut back on the amount of uh, megadata. I want to try to have far more oversight. Um, I, I have far more transparency in what we do. And on those cases where we have what we call, for those who are not from the United States, we have what we call the FISA court, where you go to get um, search warrants, but it's a secret court. You get search warrants to go after some of this data. I'm, I'm asking we have a permanent council to raise the other side. So it's an adversarial system. And then that the uh, decisions and this can easily be done, within a short period of time, be made public. Even if some of the names are made public. I, uh, and then limitation, what we call national security letters, where you can just go in and grab everything. Uh, just because we can do it in the United States doesn't mean we should. I don't think it makes us safer any more than the horrible excesses of Watergate and, and J. Edgar Hoover and all made us safer. It made us less safe. Thank you. Let me turn now to Augie Fabella. You were 26 in 1992 when you founded Vimplecom in Russia. Uh, I guess then it was 100 mobile phones. Now you're up to uh, 214 million customers in 18 countries. Uh, so that's half of your sort of biography. Another half is that you have since uh, had a real interest in public safety and law enforcement and are a deputy sheriff's deputy in suburban Chicago, correct? I am. So, Augie, okay, you're a perfect person to see this from both angles. <laughs> Let's just start. Presume you're on the receiving end of the phone call. There's been some process. What, what is it like, from the point of view of an internet or uh, cellular service provider, with governments possibly around the world 
clamoring for information, metadata, data, mega data about your customers, and how does how does that get handled on the corporate side? You, you know, I, I, I'm going to add, first of all, a much more positive view to, to the fact that we have all this data can be turned into a huge, huge positive. And, uh -huh. and so I'm, I'm going to, I'll, I'll end with that, but let me kind of address exactly sure. what you said. We work in, in countries of great opportunity, I'll call them. We're, we're in Russia, we're in Algeria, we're in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Canada, I'll even throw in there. Uh, <laughs> but... I'll tell you one the common, last frontier. What, one common theme. Well, I, I raise that because the common theme across all of these is we get the same request from every single government. They have access to absolutely everything. It's legal. Um, we, we comply. We challenge, uh, of course, that everything they're doing is by court order and or by legislation. So, so we take on a responsibility as a corporate because our customers trust us and we have to do our best to protect their privacy. And, and we, just we give us a quick that. flavor of the range of the challenges. Is it to make sure the paperwork's in order and has the right uh, officials and primitors on it, or do you occasionally say, we're going to challenge this in court, even if our subscriber doesn't know? Um, we, we have not taken anything to court. Uh -huh. We have not. We've challenged it with the regulator and dialogue. We've Got been it. able to narrow scope. Uh, uh -huh. So it has been a productive dialogue. Uh -huh. a, a lot of times, at least what we found, they're asking for more than what they need. I mean, that, that's actually on my, putting on my law enforcement hat of, of work that I've been doing in Chicago. Yeah. There's a lot of data that's, that's there already that, yeah. that you don't need to go and gather more. There's a lot that you can do with what you have. And so we actually do work with regulators, with governments to say, look, what are you after? This is all you need. You don't need more than this. And we're actually finding a very receptive dialogue. And, and, and that's where, where I think the future of the problem solution is going to be is in having that kind of dialogue between all the stakeholders Got it. To, to find the right balance. Now, you'd wanted to say something positive about megadata. Here's your opportunity. Well, again, there, there's great information that can be taught, that, 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 that can be derived to, to come up with e-health initiatives, with e-learning initiatives, with e-government initiatives, things that are out there that will help make things more efficient. And being able to understand the, the universe of needs is there in that mega data. It's just a matter of responsibly using it and, would you and providing a real good service. That and would you want. include that for national security purposes as respective governments gather perhaps as much as they can? Yeah, I'm probably closer to Senator Leahy's view that there probably isn't a need for such an overbearing get everything. You know, law enforcement has done a pretty good job of having a system of getting what you need to prosecute criminals. Uh, and there is a judicial oversight. You have to get warrants to go and, and dig deeper into uh, different things. But there's just a lot of available data that you can use responsibly without overbearing upon everything. You need to target the, the real criminals. You don't need to target the whole population. Uh huh. Brad Smith, let me turn to you. You uh, were at Covington and Burling in 1986, big American law firm, and it said that you made as a condition of your employment that you'd be given a personal computer for your desk. And uh, maybe that pointed uh, your career direction a little bit. At Microsoft for at least 20 years, general counsel since 2002 in the wake of 9-11 uh, there. And I gather Microsoft has had to deal with innumerable ways in which it connects to governments. And I'm curious how much your experience tracks what Algie was sharing. I think there's a, a definitely a certain similarity. I think if there's one theme that sort of transcends perhaps what you're hearing from us uh, up on this panel, it's the notion that human rights includes privacy uh, and that governments should obtain information about citizens pursuant to legal process that does indeed you know, have judicial review uh, and respect for international norms. And you know, what that means when it comes to not just Microsoft as a company, but I think uh, our industry is a couple of things. Number one, uh, you know, when governments come to us and say, help us, just give us some information about some people. Uh, and that happens. You know, I, as you mentioned, I started in this job shortly after 9-11. And there have been many instances around the world by many governments where they say, we have a problem. Will you turn over information? And my response has always been the same pass a law, you know, a, file a, a warrant or a subpoena, give us the opportunity to consider whether we should go to court, 
Give us the ability to, to work with us, others to ensure it complies with international norms. It is not our right, no one elected us, to simply decide that we want to turn over somebody else's information. That, I think, is one pillar. I think the other pillar is, due to the disclosures of the last year, you know, it has become apparent, at least according to what was reported in the Washington Post, that you know, there has been some just going and get it yourself efforts, including you know, from American technology companies in terms of tapping into cables, you know, running between data centers. You know, it was reported about the data centers for Yahoo, the data centers for Google. None of us in our industry assume that those are the only two. And so you see us across the industry, in effect, hardening our technology, you know, embracing stronger encryption. And I think that is all to reinforce the need for governments to, in fact, use the rule of law and the rule of law alone to get information about citizens. If an engineer walked into your office, having been directed there by everyone else, and said, I have just invented a form of Outlook email so encrypted that even though it's stored on Microsoft servers, even with government process, no one but the sender and the recipient can read it. Uh, would you be excited about that and say, now we've got our next advertising campaign, or would you say, this is a terrible headache? I think that is a general trend in which technology is going. I mean, basically, you know, as, as you describe it, you strengthen encryption and you enable customers alone to have the encryption <coughs> keys. There are some <coughs> distinctions that one has to focus on, and I don't know that your question directly raises it, but it's nonetheless, I think, the, the heart of what you're, you're addressing. You know, we get, you know, at, from time to time, we'll get governments wanting information not about individuals, and individuals are, of course, usually the suspects for criminal activity, but they'll be seeking information uh, from businesses, uh, from other governments, from NGOs. Uh, and uh, our, our position, which I you know, just believe in very strongly, is if governments want information from a business, go serve the order on the business. Don't come to us just because we happen to have the data in the data center. Uh, and, and we've committed and stated publicly you know, that we will take that position as a matter of litigation tactics. We'll put that in our contracts with our customers. And while you know, some of the litigation you know, is classified, I have said and I can say that we have never turned over to any government any information that belongs to a business or an NGO or, or another government. In other words, we haven't yet lost such a case. And one last question. Uh, so far we've been talking, as far as surveillance goes, about particularized, targeted individuals for which there might be a warrant or other process given to the company that has the data on the individuals. How about the fishing expedition that Senator Leahy was referring to? And we can think of the most sympathetic uh, example may be possible, which would be, we think there's some security threat, the Olympics are coming up, um, there's a particular document that is a uh, purchase order for a certain amount of explosive, you name it. Anybody with that document in his or her email account is going to be somebody. We would have particular information. We just don't know who it is. Could you run a scan, if you could run a scan, of everybody's email looking for that attachment? Would you? No. Not going to do it. One search away to find that. Uh, no, manifest. look, it's, I mean, we will do what we are ordered by governments to do if we lose a case and have no choice but to comply. Yes. But yeah, let's start with the United States. You know, our entire Constitution is based on the principle, I would argue, that the investigations of crimes need to be based on individuals for which there is probable cause to believe that someone is engaged in criminal behavior. Yes. Now, you know, there, there may be certain uses that people want to make of so-called broader metadata, but I, I agree with what Senator Leahy said. Yes. Yeah, I think that there are alternative ways to serve the public safety without putting the civil liberties of individuals at risk in the way that you do yes. when you move away from investigations that are based on probable cause yes. and focused on individuals. Before I open it up broadly, let's uh, finish a visit with each of our panel members. So let me turn now to Orit uh, Gadiesh. Uh, Orit, you also have had, back in the day, I guess, a, uh, an affiliation with military intelligence, but more recently have been uh, at Bain and Company, 
Charing Bain and have been thinking a lot about this from the corporate perspective um, and about trust. And I'd like to uh, give you an opportunity to say something about that. There's been discussion here about the NSA and about how it would be nice if it was more transparent. On the other hand, the NSA cannot be totally transparent without destroying its effectiveness. I think that's pretty clear and it has been established. I would say that they're not, not the only ones in that box, that data companies actually are very much so. Let me give you a very quick example to illustrate that. You've probably never heard about a company called Rap Genius. It's where you go to get the lyrics to your favorite um, uh, rap singers. On Christmas Eve, its unique head count, hit count dropped by 85%. Why? Because Google decided that Rap Genius was trying to game the algorithm of the search engine, and uh, it retaliated by moving them all the way down in their search The so-called Google page. death penalty. The <laughs> For which I don't know that Amnesty has weighed in on that yet. <laughs> they, they have an opportunity. <laughs> Making a note. Yes. Now, um, this wasn't arbitrary. Uh, Rap Genius admitted that they had tried to game the system, if you will, since apologize have been reinstated. Um, let me be clear. I'm not saying that Google did something wrong. The point is that we have no way of judging whether what they did was fair. Uh, we have no way of judging with, what, what, if the behavior of Rap Genius was bad or not because we don't actually know how the algorithm, the search algorithm really works. And Google is not about to tell us, and for very good reason. Yes. If they made it public, then everybody would game the algorithm and then Google and the public lose. This is actually a big dilemma for Google and companies like that, and that's the point I'm trying to make. And if they had asked Bain as management consultants to advise them on this dilemma, what might you say? Well, the first thing I would say is users have to trust that the algorithm is even-handed. If they don't, they're going to leave and your business collapses. On the other hand, Google can't justify that trust by being completely transparent uh, for the reasons I just mentioned before, equal to the NSA. So the most, the most important, by the way, they're not the only ones. I'll just say one thing and then answer your question. This is really what characterizes the way that we use the internet. An awful lot of trust and very little transparency. And trust without Transparency is a very frail proposition. It's a little bit like justice. It needs not only to be done, but also to be seen to be done. So the most important thing I would say for companies like that, data companies, is to be upfront, to be proactive about those issues. And, and there are myriad of issues. People think about um, Facebook, for example. Oh, it's free. No, it's not a free service. We actually pay. We pay with our data. The question is, who owns the data? For how long? What can they do with the data? Do they have a fiduciary duty towards the people that supply them with the data? So, uh, and they are contracts, by the way. We all sign the click contract, but uh, Facebook's runs over 27,000 words. That's longer yes. than uh, Romeo and Juliet of Shakespeare. So the key is, uh, and Brad probably would be the best to answer that. You could ask if that uh, thoughtless click on agree is a meaningful yes. um, uh, agreement. Yes. Legally, it might prevent you from harm, yes. but reputation-wise, probably not really. So right. the idea is be upfront, be proactive. Yes. There are a couple of ideas we can talk about before something happens that forces you into a corner that you yes. don't want to be in. Well, the common aphorism is online, if something is free, it means that you're not the customer, you're the product, <laughs> and uh, somebody else is getting uh, the benefit. Uh, Brad, I don't know if you have any quick thoughts on that, given the number of hats you wear uh, at Microsoft and different products. Well, just real quickly to answer the question, yeah, the, there's probably most courts in most countries would find that the contract is enforceable, but I guess it sort of goes back to, again, one of the points that was made earlier, just because it can be done doesn't necessarily mean it should. Yes. And, you know, I, I think I agree fundamentally there is no such thing as trust without transparency. Yes. You just can't sustain it. And, you know, what it also means is you can't you know, maintain trust if people can't understand what you're doing. Yes. And I think it's hard to expect people to understand something that requires yeah. 27,000 words to explain. 
So ultimately, I don't think you can maintain confidence without a certain level of simplicity. Yes. Um, so, you know, contracts serve a certain role, and there's a limit on the role they serve, and I think that's the real point here. I guess the question behind the question is, when we think of Big Brother, the classic Orwellian incarnation is as the state, but today there is an addition to the state, and lots of states, mm -hmm. lots of private firms gathering all sorts of stuff. I don't know how many people are taking the health challenge right now, but we walked credulously into a room, and uh, the questions kept coming. It wanted to know my height, my weight, my gender. And your age. All my friends, <laughs> enlisting all my friends to watch how much I sleep. I'm like, well, all right, this will be good. And I should ask about that on the Big Brother panel tomorrow. Well, I, I, th I, I, I think the real uh, point, and I think it's really a fundamental one, is just start with something simple. People are people. But there's two fundamental relationships that are at stake when we're talking about privacy. Uh, one is the relationship between citizens and the state. And that relationship has been, over the last few decades, I would say, uh, more generally debated and regulated through law in the United States for reasons that have to do in part with our Constitution. Then there's the relationship between consumers and companies. And that relationship has been more heavily debated and regulated in Europe, in part for reasons that have had to do with the constitution of the European Union. But of course, if we're just people, and it's all the same information, you know, it's not unfair, in my opinion, to start to recognize that these are two halves of a common circle. It doesn't mean that the answer on each half of the circle is necessarily the same. But it probably does mean it's beneficial to look at how they fit together, and in the process, frankly, bring together some of the discussion that has been unfolding for many years in Europe with some of the discussion that has been unfolding for many yes. years in North America. Yes. Well, uh, we should talk to our uh, last panelist here, especially for an integrative approach. Sham Sankar is uh, from Palantir Technologies. And uh, Palantir is the kind of name of a company that tends to bemuse people. Um, can you tell us directly, what does Palantir do? And give us your thought about uh, big data and your anticipated uses of it, given that you consult both, I gather, for public and private entities and on the use of that data. Certainly. Uh, Palantir is a big data company. I think anytime you're dealing with data, when we started the business 10 years ago, really thinking about uh, how do you protect data? Uh, you can't, when you, at, at a political level, just thinking about the government for a moment, at a political level, you think about uh, do we have security and at what cost to privacy? Do we have privacy and at what cost to security? I think it'd be appropriate to actually model the lack of privacy as a threat to security because the, the lack of faith that people have in the state is actually a threat to the state. And therefore, you need to actually be investing in technologies that improve privacy with the same vigor that you invest in technologies that improve security. That was the thesis of the business. Uh, and, and that's what we focused on. So what do you do? We allow you to integrate disparate data in a way that preserves the underlying source of that information. Where did I get this data? How did I collect this data? What does that imply about who can see it, under what conditions, so for how long? So just as an example, to try to pull a, a number of threads here together, I gather an Amazon Kindle knows exactly what page I read until I got bored. Um, it has me tracked, and even how long it took me to read it. If I'm wearing my jawbone up at the same time, it'll know what pages tended to get my heart rate elevated. Or if you fell asleep while you Or were if I fell asleep while I was reading it. Um, I gather that part of the health challenge here is to integrate that across Everyone. So, for instance, I think the plan is we're going to know whether the parties on Thursday night or Friday night are more interesting to people, as reflected by when they called it a night or perhaps fell over in a stupor. And uh, given all of those bases, could you see a public authority coming to the likes of Palantir sometime and saying, I want to know what our most dangerous literature is? What is it that's getting people up in arms when they read Workers of the World Unite so all of a sudden? they're going to the following meeting. I mean, is that just crazy, or is that called 2015? I think that's crazy, but I also think that uh, you know, we don't collect any data. So when you think about megadata, there are yes. two pieces to it. Uh, how does the government, or how does the state and the citizenry agree to 
the rules around what data can be collected. And we talked, that's actually, a lot of our focus has been on what are you allowed to collect, what are you allowed to get. Um, the second part that I think is also really important, given just the amount of data that exists in the world, is regulating how you're allowed to use that data. Yes. Uh, and, and that's a component that, that's more nascent. It needs a lot of thought. Uh, and without, without the two components, so under, if you're gonna regulate how it's used, you also need very robust, independent capabilities for oversight and auditing of it. In the same way, this is probably an analogy that's, that's more accessible to those on, on, in the security apparatus, but in the same way that you pursue intelligence, counter, counterintelligence threats with incredible vigor, I think you need to pursue privacy threats with incredible vigor. They're equally challenging threats to the state. But you have confidence that restrictions can be placed on use so that we don't have to restrict collection. It's okay that floating around in the world are what pages of what I think books you need to I've do both. read. You, you need to do both. So uh, restricting collection is where most people have been focused. I think that some amount of collection is inevitable. Uh, as companies create more features, you're going to be collecting data that was maybe originally intended to be used for advertising purposes yes. that can subsequently have unintended uses. So those unintended uses need to be governed. Yes. The data already exists. So under current process, you can get access to that data. Yeah. Now there's a the question of should you be able to get access to that data? Yes. So Leo, you'd wanted to say yeah, something. I, I think just you know, in terms of the, the, the average person like, who doesn't know that much about this, <clears throat> the details of what's going on, I think it's good to use the analogy of a video camera in your bedroom or your house, where basically you're being told that you know, we're just filming the whole thing. We're not going to look at it. We're just filming it. Um, and you know, how are you going to feel about that? Um, we might pick on some of them. When we want to, we look at it. That's the problem. That's, and, and there's a boiling frog problem here because most people are not affected right now. So no, the public are not concerned with it right now. You know? It only concerns them when they start getting uh, their personal cases being actually investigated. But actually, it affects everybody, but nobody's feeling the pinch. The other point I wanted to make is that, you know, particularly the World Economic Forum and these kind of discussions, we forget that most of the world's population doesn't live in the United States and Europe. You know, it's just amazing how we have conversations about uh, the world from a US and Europe centric view, and much of the discussions about these places. And imagine what's going to be happening in other places. You know, if we're allowed to do this in the US and Europe. Uh, the, the credibility and the impact that, uh, you know, what NSA, PRISM, GCHQ can do. Yes. Uh, and you, you mentioned, you know, have you taken up a legal case? We've tried to, but, you know, when it comes to these things, there is no route. You actually can't even go to court because when it comes to security issues, there, that's the whole point about having the rule of law, a judicial overview, and transparency. Nobody really knows what these people are up to. And there How are, plenty, are you supposed to hold them to account? Plenty of places where the rule of law does not obtain, but the technologies are happily finding their way into use. Senator Leahy, and then we should open it up. Well, I just, I, I just think of hearing some of this. Uh, you look at the Arab Spring. That, I think it would be argued if it had been for the social media and the ability of it uh, to unite people, we never would have seen, it, at least to the extent it did. But then what happened afterward, you saw governments cracking down on that. Uh, you talked about how uh, Amnesty International uh, website is blocked in China and Russia, two countries that do crack down on, on people's speech and their ability to transmit uh, uh, Senator, views. Senator, I just wouldn't want Russians to block our site. It's Saudi Arabia who does it, along oh, sorry, with China. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, in Saudi Arabia, not another example, one that should not be blocking it for obvious reasons, but let's the, the point is this, it can be very good to have it, to get ideas and to have, if you're gonna have a participatory uh, uh, population, this is an extremely good way to do it. But it's also gonna be why uh, countries that do not want a diversity of, of views are, are going to uh, crack down. You talked about the camera in your house None of us would accept the fact that uh, the government said, we just want, we're just going to come by your house. We're going to uh, copy everything you've got in there, all your files, any of your check receipts, all that. But we're not going to look at it. We'd be up in arms. The fact is they have the ability to do it because it's all on, online today. Brad uh, and his company and several others joined an open letter to me and to members of Congress and to the president 
asking for some controls on what we're able to do here. Actually, I, I enjoyed the letter because it reflected a lot of the legislation the Congressman Sensenbrenner and I have introduced to put these controls. You, you have you have two two things very quickly. I'll say one is, of course, the threat that any government, when the abilities are in here, can use them in a very repressive way, not in a way to secure their people, but to re repress their people. The other thing, if governments, whether it's the United States or any other large government is seeing overusing it, you're going to find, as the European Union and others have done, to try to put severe limitations, which is going to make it very difficult for Microsoft and Google, Apple and all these others to have any kind of international uh, uh, ability to compete. Got it. I want to open it up to questions, and there are lots of them. There are three Mike Wranglers, so whoever can attract a Wrangler wins. Mike Wranglers, I love it. <laughs> and uh, feel term. free to tell us who you are, uh, if you like. It is the Big Brother session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm Jean-Marie Guéin. I'm the former chairman of the uh, French Commission uh, for the White Paper on National Security and Defense. Uh, and I want to follow up on what Ms. Gadiesh uh, said. Because I think on the one hand, we don't like the government to look at the haystack. But on the other hand, in a way, the haystack has become interesting for Google, and it has become interesting for governments because of the power of computing. I mean, for governments, detecting anomalies in a haystack, cross-checking with financial records, with all sorts of other records, is what's interesting. And so the, the search process, in a way, has been put on its head. Instead of looking at an individual, you look at a mass of data, and you see what stands out in those data. And so my question really to the panel is, how can you effectively put checks and balance on algorithms, uh, on algorithms so that they are not abusive and so that the use of those algorithms is not abusive? Can I respond to that? Yeah, sure, we'll read. I won't talk from the government point of view, although I've read some of what Senator Lehi said and he has some ideas. But let me just throw out a number of suggestions. First, let's remember that the internet is relatively young. It's 20 years old, so there, there hasn't been that much discourse, although the debate is becoming. But I think for companies who have actually the most self-interest, the government can eventually get away with it for a while, and users can decide what they put. Companies really decide on it for their survival. If, if users don't use them, their business goes to hell. So continuing. To your point, and continuing what I said before about being up front, uh, some, I'll throw some ideas. Uh, one could be uh, companies, data companies, having an ombudsman, if you will, like the press has. may not be a great idea because usually he or she um, work for the company. Um, but uh, you might think about companies coming up with a privacy board that has responsibility towards the users, not unlike a board of directors that has a responsibility towards shareholders when it comes to finances and risk. This would be a board of credible outsiders that will have access to data, will have to be secret about the data, like a board of directors, and will come up with an annual privacy report. Or you might even think about an annual audit report done by an outside third party, not unlike editors, uh, in fact, today's, it was interesting, today's Financial Times talks about the concentrated cash pile puts recovery in hands of the few who are the data companies. Well, I can see, I'm sorry, some of these data companies actually perhaps financing an institute that is separate that would come up with generally accepted privacy guidelines, yes. not unlike accounting guidelines or rules, yes. that will actually serve as a audit function yes. as an audit privacy function. Yes. Again, it's the beginning of the debate, yes. but there are some ideas that should be So, so far, a number of structural adjustments that companies could make within the corporate form to try to be more sensitive to... And it's to, to their self-interest. Yes, and it looks like Augie and Brad yeah. want to say something. Yes. Let me just add, the good news is, as Orrit said, companies' self-interest mandates that the interests of the consumer and the company are the same. Exactly. Because if we're not a trusted guardian and a trusted advisor, we will lose that customer. They that will is fair. It's us. what Exxon said right up until the Valdez. <laughs> so 
the but question it's be may up be. With What's that? I, I, I agree with what we're saying here, which yes. is it has to be backed up with action. Yes. Microsoft has one initiative. Uh, we actually do have exactly that within our company where we actually look at what do we do to protect the privacy of the consumer because that is a strategic asset. I mean, at the end yes. of the day, the consumer is everything. Yes. Brad. I think there's just, your question is really interesting. And I think to me, it points to one concept that is important that doesn't answer every scenario, but it's worth thinking about. If you think about the power of big data and machine learning, um, if you're trying to have a haystack, as you put it, that you want to use to do research, medical research, social science research, you name it, you can anonymize the data. And indeed, regulators, especially in Europe, you know, required Microsoft and Yahoo and Google to anonymize search results if they were going to be retained for more than 18 months. But if you're doing a law enforcement investigation or a national security investigation, look, I'm not the foremost expert, but I don't know that anonymized haystacks are very valuable. So, you know, the, I, I think <laughs> they, they might be, but, but if you're actually, I, maybe. But if so, then maybe that's an answer on both sides of the ledger. But anonymization of data is a way to uh, preserve benefits while increasing real privacy protection. Before we take the next question, I just want to ask uh, Cham if there's anything you want to say on the topic of big data here. How useful is it? How useful yeah. is it anonymized? Well, it, you know, uh, Vermont has a very public public health issue right now. And actually, I think there's a lot of value in the haystack applying, connecting these two dots here. If you take the payer information you have, you can actually predict who's about to overdose. And that gives you an opportunity to intervene and, and solve a very important public health issue. Uh, you know, there are limits to how far you can go with that if, if it's completely anonymized. You can't do the intervention. You know that someone is about to overdose. Then there's a question of how do you do the intervention. <laughs> but that, this, is what I, this is exactly what I was talking about when I talked about you have to have rules around the data use. So if you're going to collect all the data, which is the incidental collection here, by the way, is to pay the bills. It yes. wasn't collected for this. You're using the payer information to now predict overdose. The question is, is this a use in the public's interest that the government, the state, and the people can get behind? And, that, and I think that's the level at which you actually have to regulate the use. Yes, very good questions. Let's take another. Where are the microphones? Is there one over here? here. Ah, right here. And is that uh, the president of Estonia, I believe, yes? <laughs> well, for the purpose of this, uh, I'm currently chairing the European Commission uh, steering group on cloud computing, and I'm also chairing the ICANN group on what the hell we're going to do in this new mess. <laughs> but, uh, it's a formal just, title of the group. <laughs> let me raise a few things. First of all, I think the big brother metaphor really is bad. Uh -huh. I think the proper metaphor is little sister, the one who knows everything about you and is willing to tell anyone. <laughs> I thought you were going to complain that it was sexist. <laughs> no. no, I mean, if you read the book by... Uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberg on big data, which is a good introduction. I mean, they have a case there where it has nothing to do with computers or yes. your use of computers. It's yes. your credit card swipes can determine if a woman is pregnant. And they do direct marketing to people who, because of their purchasing, which has already been termed by big data, that they are pregnant because they're buying this, that, or something else, will call people up or they will send direct mails to people, which cause a, a big scandal because of... People may not be public about their pregnancies. Right. Well, what happened was families. that they got an irate phone call from a father who said, Why, how dare you send this to my 15-year-old daughter? They go, oh, no, now we're going to get a tremendous lawsuit, this being the litigious USA. Yes. And then the next day, they call the guy up and say, well, we'll offer you something. And then the father says, actually, I have to apologize. She is pregnant. Uh, so in fact, big data is very, very effective. But on the other hand, this has nothing to do with your what you do on, uh, what you do on your computer. So yes. big data, little si sister is my but it's not big brother. I mean, uh -huh. it's the corporate sector is much bigger. Second issue no one's talked about because they're so concerned about privacy, actually, which is far more important, I think, is integrity, data integrity. One thing is they're reading your mail, the other is changing your content. Someone's going to change your blood group. Uh, so this is integrity as a term of art that means keeping it the way it originally right. was written. And I think and that's, far more, that's, yes. I mean, that's far more dangerous. I mean, privacy, fine. I'm, I'm very worried about privacy, but I think we have... We, we haven't gotten beyond that because if they can look at your data, they can probably change your data. Yes. Um, I would argue that it's all in the security of our architecture. I make a joke that our national system could probably use the NSA servers and they wouldn't know what's happening because NSA shut down LavaBit for 512, RSA 512, 
encryption because they couldn't break into it, and we use RSA 2048, which is two orders of magnitude higher. And 16 no airtight compartments had the Titanic. <laughs> well, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, uh, no. If you know anything about it, then, uh, then RSA 2048 is not going to be broken for a long time. Yes. Um, to put things in perspective, the U.S. is terrible, but in the United States, to, uh, I mean, in, in, in Russia, since 2003, a law says all ISPs have to feed their servers through the, through the FSB, which used to be the KGB. So Yes. Um, another thing is that uh, basically I think we're overly paranoid because uh, no one's, I mean, rarely do they do deep packet inspections. They're looking at who's talking to whom, which may in fact be a legitimate question if you're in Hamburg and suddenly yes. ordering 3,000 kilograms of fertilizer. Yes. It might mean something. So, I mean, let's not get overboard on all of this. The privacy issue is actually new. Uh, ever, it's only since Brandeis of 1895 has the issue of privacy come into the legal space. So it's also not, it's not, this is, a, this is not since Plato yes. and Aristotle. So we have to think about it. Um, should I ask how many more are on the list? Two. <laughs> Two. One thing I would say that, I, that people should realize there's no such thing as a free app, which is a different way of saying, that. but basically if you have a free app, Make it. You know, you're just, you're being monetized. It is interesting, by the way, that there's not a common practice in the industry to say, look, I'll pay you $5 or 5 euros or whatever if you agree that all my data stays with me. C consider me the advertiser buying myself out. Why can't we buy ourselves out? Can it's, we a new business it's a new business model. You, can you heard it here first. No. <laughs> and finally, I would say that really I think the problem what we see here is uh, if, any, if anyone has read the 1959 essay by C.P. Snow, The Two Cultures, yes. it never really caused much damage before. But now, what do we have? I mean, this whole situation comes out of people saying, wow, look what engineers saying, what, look at what we can do. But they've never read anything in the humanities in their lives. And if you look at the other side, if you look at the stuff, to be polite, about what's being written about what Snowden is doing, it really has very little to do with reality because, you know, I mean, the re reporting is absolutely abysmal. Yes. It's sensationalist, and if you actually look at what is possible to be done, it's not like every person in the world is having their emails yes. read. It's very hard to read emails, but, they may, but it's fairly yes. easy to say who you're talking to. Thanks. President Ilves, I thank you for that kaleidoscopic intervention, <laughs> and I dub you our seventh panelist. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Jeff Jarvis. Oops, there's one over here. Microphone. Yes, right here. Echo one. Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So I, I have a list of seven things, but I will only do, give you the top two. Uh, one <laughs> of them is that, um, yes, the fact I, I, we have to think about these things in terms of the power of the computers and the way things actually uh, the, the way things, the, the, these algorithms actually work. And as the first, uh, somebody already mentioned, that's, uh, uh, this big haystack isn't looked at, isn't filed by person. So it, you can imagine, we know that the search engines do, do give us tremendously good results by scooping up absolutely everything and then looking from a long distance, and in fact, to be technical, taking the eigenvectors of it, looking for clusters, looking for trends. Yes. And we get used to the system being able to pick out trends in Twitter, and so on, by looking at a huge amount and picking these things out, that this, you know, maybe terrorism is trending. And that is not, is not, that is not, that, con that concept of something trending, it's not associated with any one person. It's got out of the morass. Yes. So we're not going to be able to fight cybercrime very powerfully without using these techniques which pick out the trends out of the morass. And they involve, and, and, and when you're operating at that level, the, the, the poor search engine has no idea which of these people are American citizens. You know, it has no idea which of these people are form, you know, you know, have been yes. uh, have been labeled in some way as being suspected of, of creating some serious crime. So we've got to be so, so to be able to say you can only work with that sort of data doesn't apply at that stage. But I is that reason for us to take heart then? Because what you're saying is what we've been inartfully referring to as an anonymous haystack may have many, many uses that then don't implicate well, individual privacy. Maybe what we need to do is to allow the have a very powerful haystack, but have it and, and do that powerful processing in a, in a non -anonymous, non -anonymous, not anonymized haystack, but have everybody who does that be treated uh, like the Andromeda strain, like they've, be got, they've got a horrible disease mm -hmm. and they're, they're locked in a bunker. And basically, and so then when the, when the system comes up with us and thinks, wow, we, you know, we look, we've seen, we understand the patterns that happen when terrorist attacks occur, and we've got something, and then at that point then, 
having processed all this non-anonymized, real, real, very powerful data, yes. uh, then you, go to, you need to go through the courts to say, okay, we want to... Now we need to find out who it is. Yep. It's interesting, so, too. It suggests the financial markets may have the PhDs working on this so they can then invest accordingly once they've made their predictions. So one of the things... So... so, so uh, yes. Yeah, so, we, so in other words, the, all, all the talking we do about data as though it's filed by person and arose by per people is just not is not recognizing the way search engines actually work nowadays and not taking not taking advantage of them. Our sort of our, what follows from that then is that people will end up with access to data which actually they could abuse, but where they need to as uh, uh, the gentleman from Panama here said, need, need, need to track where it came from and what it can therefore be used for. So when I think one of the things we, where directions we need to move is from talking about, thinking about locking data down to, uh, to thinking about how even if you do get the data, what can you use it for? So what we could do with international agreements on and places like this are what sort of thing of data is it reasonable to use if you are giving somebody insurance, figuring out somebody's insurance premium? If you are deciding whether to employ them, for example. There are all kinds of things where you can't discriminate in a lot of countries. In the US, you're not allowed to discriminate on grounds of gender, for example. We could start adding a whole lot of So this could be a lot data. of use restrictions that on pain of breaking yeah. the law, so say, one would so in, have in a, to abide. So in a company, you yes. just set up processes so that, yes. no, we don't. Yes, we may have lots of data, yeah, uh, but we don't use it for all the critical things which, which in, about people's lives. Yes. We end up uh, having norms about how different yes. data is just <coughs> not appropriate and perhaps, even, perhaps illegal for use for making those particular corporate decisions. Yes. Hey, Jonathan, Thank you. Tim yeah, should be one of those people on one of those independent uh, uh, agencies. Tim, it looks like about. you've just been volunteered <laughs> to chair the committee that's going to do it. Absolutely. And President Ilves yes, has skill in naming committees <laughs> and uh, perhaps could join as well. <laughs> No, yes. I just, I just concerned on the on the use restrictions. I don't want to try to summarize everything that was just said, but on use restrictions, this could also be a difficult thing. Much as I I want to protect everybody's privacy, how do you know today which things may be very beneficial to you tomorrow uh, in in uh, analyses of consumer trends? Uh, you're an investor, you're a buyer, you're uh, a parent who has a child with a rare disease. I mean, sometimes it can be extraordinarily helpful the more yes. material that is out there. My concern, and as a United States Senator, my concern is that we live in an age where we give up a lot of privacy. Neither you nor I, nor any of the experts in this room, can say what more can be taken five years from now because these things are changing so much. Just think about that. We could talk today about all the great things we want to do, but five years from now, we don't know what might not be out there or we might not know what's out there. My concern is to the extent a government can snoop on you and can alter your abilities to act in a free way. Oh, Congressman so-and-so, you're not going to support us on this. Uh, Bill, you know, I'm really upset because somebody told me one of our agencies that you've been sending money to, what's this woman's name, Fifi Laboom Boom? Does your wife know about this? I mean, not that I would ever tell anybody, but... This is we, back can, to J. Edgar Hoover. This is back to J. Edgar Hoover. But don't think that just because this happened with J. Edgar Hoover that this might not happen again, whether it's my government or the governments of any of the countries here. And I think that we we get excited about all the things we can do, and we should be, because it's remarkable. But if we don't have overriding a sense of how do we protect our privacy, at some point, you are going to be hurt. Well, Senator, you've highlighted again the special responsibility that governments might have, mm -hmm. given that they are powerful and they typically have a monopoly over the use of force, to. Uh, limit their snooping and their use of personal information. But I took President Ilves's intervention and uh, Sir Tim's intervention both to be talking about in this little sibling aspect of things, 
that today's tools that are only in the hands of the NSA and its counterpart organizations are going to be tomorrow's corporate tools, and the day after, they're going to be individual tools well, some that we of them can are, use. Some of them are already yes. in the corporate tools. Don't think yes. that the NSA has a monopoly on this. So is there any hope of meaningful regulation or restraint there of the sort that it sounded like Tim was calling for when there's not a known body of regulated companies to target? Well, there's certain things you can do. For example, uh, I have legislation, and a lot of companies have not liked the idea, but now I think there's building support for it, is that when there's been a breach, you're going to have to make this public very quickly. Uh, we saw with what happened with the Target, oh, we've had a breach of a few hundred thousand, or a few million, or a few tens of millions, or, you know, as it keeps coming down. Well, I think... If you're putting all this stuff online and you're, what is it, through your credit card or you're banking by, uh, by computer or anything else, if there's been a breach, you have a right to know that immediately. And yet, there are companies that don't want to go along with that. Yes. Brad? I think part of what this captures is, frankly, the multifaceted and, and complex nature of the topic. Because I think a use model has a huge amount of promise, especially when you look at the, uh, the analysts, of the, uh, the collection of, of data, and then its subsequent use in, in, say, the private sector. But I do think that it's harder to embrace a use model, at least in my opinion, for the government, especially when you take into account the fact that most people in the world do not live in the United States or the European Union. And you know, if you turn the data over to the government, you basically lose I, for all practical purposes, any subsequent ability as an individual or any private entity to know what the government is going to do or to restrict what the government is going to do with that information. And one also needs to take into account the fact that governments change. And so, you know, in some ways, I just think there may be different answers for parts of this and other answers for other parts. And I think transparency plays a key role, but in all honesty, the least transparent player is always the government. Companies are pretty transparent, and, and I, I get how that regulation might be resisted by, by some companies, but that's just short-sightedness. That, that, will, that will work itself out, because yes. the more transparent you are, the more trust you build. But the governments are the ones that are least transparent as to what they're accessing. And even if that got into the public debate, then at least there's a chance of finding a solution yes. and that balance. Yes. Can I just add that also to back to the companies? That also harms companies, especially since they are global in nature and operating under a certain law. So companies that are operating under American law have a chance of losing their clients, customers, users in Germany, which has very different in Europe and, and uh, um, et cetera. And actually, this is a direct harm both to the economy and to the companies that operate in this jurisdiction. Yes. Jonathan, if yes, I could, sir. I, 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 of course, it's very complex and it's changing, and you know we have to be very flexible and adaptive in the way in which we deal with this. But you know, some of the basics of the the principles of the rule of law don't change in that sense because essentially we are saying that if you're collecting data, then there has to be some rules around that, and people need to know that you're doing it. And if they're not happy with what you're doing, they need to be able to go to somebody and they have a right to complain and some remedy. Yes, and it's exactly the same with the usage. If you're going to use it, people need to know you're using it. And if they're not happy with the usage, they should be able to have redress. Yes. So we have to kind of, at one level, simplify the conversation. Yes. Otherwise, we say everything is too complicated. We can't do anything about no, it. No, it's a great reminder that everything new is still old again. It's our reminder from President Vilva's about Brandeis and Warren that, that we've been struggling with this for years. Maybe just the last piece of the puzzle as we wrap is perhaps the other piece of Big Brother, back literally to the book 1984, was not just the government uh, surveilling people and learning what they were up to and figuring out who their dissidents were, but persuading people that the government was all about, in that book, propaganda. And when I think of propaganda, somehow, occasionally, the thought of advertising comes into my head. And we think of the most common use of data gathered, particularly in the private half of things, it is for better targeted advertising. I don't know if I have a cat or a dog and which food then to advertise to me. To imagine all of that data being put to use to send me very targeted messages designed to get me to be outraged at this or feeling some way about that, 
I gather we haven't really even begun to think about that yet, and I'd be interested, I'll have to read one of those privacy policies to say, <laughs> we reserve the right to make any use of your data to try to get you to believe whatever it is somebody paid us to but get you to believe. Also, it'll take you know, three <laughs> weeks to read it. It's, it's really interesting because, you know, if at this point in time we feel that, okay, at least it's NSA and it's GCHQ and, you know, it's our government and it's our corporations who have access. But you know, you're going to have Chinese companies, Indian companies, Brazil's talking about doing a separate cabling system and a separate you know, uh, data centers. So I mean, people who are taking it very complacently right yes. now in the West, I think there's going to be a real wake up call yes. when there's a whole different ball game happening somewhere else. Yes. But, well, also, but also, you're back we, to your transparency issue about how, for example, the search engine done. If right, you knew so it, they wouldn't be able to influence you because you'd understand yes. it. So we're back to where we started. Yes. Senator Leahy, you have and the last I, word. Okay, I just say in the U.S., you mentioned Brandeis long before Brandeis. The issue of privacy is brought up in the framers of our Constitution. And uh, they could not imagine what's happening today. I, I would suggest we can't imagine what's going to happen 20 years from now and we'd better start paying a heck of a lot more attention than we're paying today. So consider it a date. We will reconvene here in 20 <laughs> years. We'll do a screening of this panel and then have a chance to laugh at our naivete. But until then, thank you all for sharing your wisdom. Thank you all. <laughs>